from ABC News Live. Your voice, your vote. 2022 election update. Here now, Diane Macedo. I'm Diane Macedo, and we want to get right to the midterm elections. Control of Congress is still too close to call. It could be days or even weeks before we know which party will control the Senate. And the House is likely to turn Republican, but that's not settled yet either. So far, Republicans have gained six House seats, while Democrats have gained one Senate seat. Not the red wave Republicans were hoping for. It was an especially disappointing night for former President Trump. But while it was better than expected for President Biden, his ability to work across the aisle could be tested like never before. Senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer joins me live now to break it all down. Devin, let's start with the House. Republicans appear likely to take control, but it's not a sure thing. Where do those last races stand? Yeah, the bottom line at this hour, Diane, is that ABC News cannot project which party will be in control of the U.S. House starting in 2023. You just had the numbers on the board. All 435 seats in Congress were up for grabs. You need 218 to get a majority. And so far, Republicans only have secured 209. So they're just short of that. They have flipped, as you see, there six seats from Democrats. They're on their way. And that's why we're able to say Republicans will likely have control. But at this hour, Diane, there are still 40 House races that are still out. They're uncalled, too close to call. So we're not able to say just yet whether Republicans will take control. If they do, as expected, it will likely be a very narrow majority, Diane. Uh, meanwhile, the Senate still could go either way. And that key Georgia race appears likely to go to a runoff. So how does that process work? What are we in for? That's right. 50-50 Senate up for grabs could come down to Georgia. Let's take a look at the results right now. Uh, just at this hour, it is very, very close. About 20,000 votes separating these two, Herschel Walker, Raphael Warnock. You need 50 percent of the vote, a majority of the vote in Georgia, uh, in order to clinch a win. Neither of the candidates, at least at this hour, seems to have that. Based on the outstanding vote, it does seem clear we're headed for a runoff. That would happen December 6th. Diane. So about a month from now, that means another month of campaigning in Georgia aggressively. It's going to be a lot of attention in that state if it does, in fact, go to a runoff. It could come down to this. Republicans uh, need to pick up two seats now to take control of the Senate. And so far, uh, it's just not clear that they'll be able to do it in Georgia. Now, we've talked a lot about the key issues in this election cycle. So what stands out to you from the exit polls? Yeah, I was looking at the exit poll this morning, Diane, fascinating. The economy, inflation, top of mind for voters. That's not surprising. In every election, it's always at the top of the list, if not the top issue. But we're looking here at Pennsylvania. Take a look at where abortion falls in this critical battleground state. It was the top issue in that state. That is unusual, and that is surprising. 36% of voters in Pennsylvania said that was the most salient issue for them, followed by inflation. Look at gun policy, 9%. A lot of gun violence in in that state, the camp, uh, Republican candidates ca campaigned on crime and gun safety. It's clear it didn't uh, wasn't a salient factor there. So abortion, we're starting to see in these battlegrounds. Diane had uh, a pretty significant role yesterday. Interesting, Devin Dwyer. Thank you. Meanwhile, in Arizona, both the governor and the Senate races are still too close to call. Hundreds of thousands of ballots still have to be counted. ABC's Zoreen Shah joins me live now from Phoenix with more on that. Zoreen, let's start with the Senate race. Democrat incumbent Mark Kelly has a slight lead over Republican Blake Masters. This is a key race in determining control of the Senate. So how long could it be till we have these results? That's the big question, Diane. And yeah, you said it too close to call. I mean, the real headline at this moment, we know things are fluid, but the headline at this very second is that Democrats are leading in every single major race here in Arizona right now in this purple state. But when it comes to that Senate race that you just mentioned, you have Kelly with 52 percent of the vote, with 68 percent of that vote in. Masters has 46 percent of that vote. I just spoke to one election official right now and asked him that very question you asked me. How long will it take before we have real results? He says, look, we're going to be counting all week long. But when I spoke to Hobbs about her specific race, about the governor's race the day before the election, she said for her race, it's going to be at least a day until Wednesday. So today until we have a good idea of the outcome. And then she says, 
by Friday, Saturday, we should have the bulk of the votes in. So it's still going to be a little bit until we know the results for, you know, the rest of these races. But they're, they're tabulating them as we speak right behind me. You can see election officials behind that window right there. Come on, guys, we're waiting. Um, Zoreen, let's talk about where the governor's race stands, because Democrat Katie Hobbs holds a narrow lead over Republican Kerry Lake. It, it is, it's much more narrow than that Senate race, Diane. You have her at 51%. You have Lake at 49 Look, Hobbs told me the day before the election, she says that it's going to likely go to a recount. That was her gut when I spoke to her on Monday. We'll see if it actually does. We'll see how close it actually ends up being. And, and as I just mentioned, she says, look, we should have a good idea of her race by today. We'll see if that actually happens. I think the interesting thing in that race, though, is that when I spoke to her supporters on Monday, they told me they were scared. I mean, they were not in Incredibly confident when I went to her headquarters, when I spoke to Carrie Lake supporters, incredibly confident, incredibly enthusiastic. Look, this was a candidate that they thought could potentially be a VP pick for Trump. But perhaps they still do, but, but it's going to be interesting to see exactly how they feel if, in fact, she does lose. A lot of eyes are going to be on that question. They sure will. All right, Zoreen Shah, thank you. And in Georgia, ABC News projects Republican Governor Brian Kemp has won re-election over Democratic opponent Stacey Abrams. But the state's high-profile Senate race between incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock and Republican Herschel Walker still too close to call as well. ABC's Ike Ajachi joins me live now from Atlanta with more on that. Ike, what's the latest? Well, Diane, heading into this Senate race, we knew it was going to be a tight one. 538 labeling this race a statistical tie leading up to Election Day. And on Election Day, both candidates, Senator Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker, were playing a sort of tug of war. One candidate would get over that 50 percent threshold, only to dip down again once more votes came in that were tabulated. Now, as of right now, both candidates sit at 49 percent of the vote, with 96 percent of precincts reporting. Senator Raphael Warnock edging out Walker right now with a slight lead, just under 20,000 votes. But we do know, like I said before, that magic number is 50 percent. If neither candidate reaches 50% of the vote, we're heading to a December 6th runoff, which means another month of political ads coming on your TV and a lot, another month of political jockeying between the two candidates, Diane. And a lot more waiting. Uh, Ike, I know you were also at the polls all day yesterday talking to voters. What sticks out to you from those conversations? Well, the voters I spoke to say that they are supporting their candidate no matter what. As a matter of fact, one part during the night, Herschel Walker came down to a screaming room of supporters and told them to just hang tight. Please hang on. And after I spoke to the supporters, that's something they're clearly ready to do. You have to understand, Georgia voters have been inundated with political attack ads, personal political attack ads, not only against Herschel Walker, but also against Raphael Warnock. And I asked some of those supporters if those personal attack ads either swayed their decision to remain committed to Herschel Walker. They told me not at all. I asked them why. And one of the main things I got is he's a bulldog. Listen, they were ref referencing to his time at the University of Georgia, where his Hall of Fame football career began. And if you know anything about Georgia, if you're a bulldog, that's a big deal. Now, they also said that they simply just didn't believe those attack ads. They said that prior months before this, they really didn't see that. But just in like the weeks leading up to the election, they were so, so inundated with these ads. They told me that they felt that they simply just didn't believe them. They thought there were lies, fabrications, all part of the political process. And obviously, when we're talking about the allegations levied against Herschel Walker, one woman told me, hey, everyone makes mistakes. Diane. All right. Ike Jachi, thank you for that. So with control of the House and Senate still too close to call, what does that mean for the future of Congress? ABC News Washington reporter Jay O'Brien is on Capitol Hill with more on the practical implications of these results. Uh, Jay, good morning. Republicans, according to ABC News projections, will gain enough seats to barely uh, flip the House if they don't lose anywhere else. So how does that compare to expectations and what does it mean for the House to be this evenly split? Well, Diane, it was a letdown for Republicans, certainly. They prepared for a celebration last night that really didn't come to fruition. It, it appears, as you had said, if they maintain this current track, that they will be in the majority. Kevin McCarthy will be poised, potentially, to become the next Speaker of the House, but it will be a slim majority. And what that slim majority means is that Kevin McCarthy, if he becomes Speaker, still has to wrangle the furthest right members of his party. They will have outsized power now, the Marjorie 
Marjorie Taylor Greene's the Freedom Caucus, and there is some pretty big legislation ahead. There's things like the debt ceiling that are on Congress's plate, and he's got to talk to his members of his party about stuff like that. Now, control of the Senate is also still anyone's game, even closer than the House. How could uh, the outcome there affect strategy for the White House moving forward? Well, certainly they will have, potentially, if Democrats maintain their majority in the Senate, they will have a chamber that's obviously allied politically with the White House. That is one thing here. But additionally, it means that they will not be getting, if Democrats have that majority in the Senate, the kinds of investigations coming out of the Senate that you might see from the House if there's a GOP majority in the House. So certainly that will be something that the president uh, will be buoyed for the president. That's A. And B, it will also be proof positive of the impact that President Biden, that former President Obama had on the trail as they were focusing at the end on those Senate races, particularly in Pennsylvania and Georgia and Nevada. All right, Jay O'Brien, thanks for that. And while much is still up in the air, one thing is clear. Democrats outperformed expectations and Republicans did not see the red wave they predicted. Let's bring in our ABC News contributors, former Democratic Congressman Joe Crowley of New York and former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock of Virginia for more. Thank you both for being here. Barbara, there is still a chance Republicans could flip both chambers, but they have to be disappointed with these results so far. What went wrong? Oh, well, certainly. Well, you know, the only red wave we really have is, uh, you know, maybe the ketchup on the walls at Mar-a-Lago. Um, you know, this was a case of, instead of having candidates, I think that were a lot of serious candidates that we should have had, maybe, you know, people like a Chris Sununu running for Senate, a Governor Ducey in Arizona, um, you know, maybe, you know, Pat Toomey staying on in Pennsylvania and winning that seat. Donald Trump ran these people out of the party and it became a Donald Trump primary, and we had these candidates who weren't, you know, you know, you kind of had these Todd Aiken like candidates that where we lost seats before in the past. And, and these candidates who their only qualification in many cases, or the most notable qualification, was fealty to Donald Trump. And people looked around and said, there's a lot of problems. And in the climate, when we had the best climate that Republicans could ever have, a bad economy, you know, inflation crime, all these issue sets that favored Republicans, we put up people that were unpalatable. And Democrats said, no, yeah, I, I don't think so. And so really, you have to look at Mar-a-Lago and Donald Trump, and he is the person who uh, set back this wave. And him being front and center, particularly at the end in places like Pennsylvania and some of these uh, swing states, had a very bad effect. And I, I think, you know, he holds the main responsibility, but also for Republicans who have given him the keys to the car to drive it over the cliff. Now, Joe, exit polls show that inflation uh, was the top issue for voters these elections. No surprise there. Polls have also showed that voters tend to trust Republicans more on that issue. So why then are we seeing Democrats outperforming expectations? Well, I think because uh, all politics is local. And each district is, dist is different. Uh, not one message uh, pertains to each district. And it's about personalities. That, as Barbara knows, you know, there's so many factors that go into elections like this, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat in these congressional districts. And that's why I think you're seeing this outcome. It also shows that voters were concerned about other issues as well. That was a big issue. Uh, but they were worried about a, their, a woman's right to choose. They were worried about uh, democracy itself. Um, they have other things that they're concerned about. And I think that also came through in this election. When you see, especially in Pennsylvania, you just heard uh, that uh, the, the, the issue of abortion was the number one issue when people going to vote uh, yesterday. And, and Barbara, I'm really short on time, but very quickly, sources close to former President Trump tell us he was fuming as the results came in last night. There's a lot of fanfare now over Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida. Uh, do you think Donald Trump's time uh, with power over the Republican Party is over? Well, I certainly have thought it should be over for a long time now. I think it just depends on if Republicans are sick of losing. Obviously, Ron DeSantis overperformed. I think there are other mainstream Republican candidates that would do much better. Normal, one Republicans who are normal won last night. DeWine, Kemp, other, you know, uh, you know, normal candidates won. Uh, the Trump candidates had a bad night. Joe, very quick final thoughts. Yeah, I think it was a really bad night for Donald Trump. As a kid from Queens, that that doesn't make me upset, quite frankly. And it was a good <laughs> night for Joe Biden. I think Biden actually had a really, really bolstering night, despite his numbers heading into the now presidential cycle. He had a really good night. All right.
Joe Crowley, Barbara Comstock, thank you both. Thanks. Coming up, election night brought a number of historic firsts across the country. We'll have more on that when we come back. Welcome back. Stocks are down on Wall Street after Election Day as we wait to learn which party will control the House and the Senate. Some of those key races are still too close to call, but exit polls already show that inflation was a top issue for voters. ABC News' Elizabeth Shelsey is here to break down some of these numbers for us. Um, Elizabeth, is there a sense of what's driving this response on Wall Street? Diane, if there are two things that the stock market doesn't like, it's uncertainty and surprises. And these elections are giving us a little bit of both of those. Wall Street had really been pricing in this red wave, and you guys have been talking about it. That is not what materialized. There's a little bit of assessing on Wall Street what's actually going to shake out. Then you have this aspect of uncertainty. How long is it going to take for these elections to be resolved? How long is this possible runoff going to go into? And that really creates a sense of what are the policy implications based on those results. You know, the understanding generally is that a divided government is better for the stock market because that means more gridlock, might not be better for Americans, but generally means companies don't have to think about risks to regulation, changes in policies, changes in the tax code. So if the House and the Senate or the Senate go towards Republicans, that could generally be seen as a good sign for the stock market, a little bit more stability going forward, less risk of kind of some more drastic policies taking place uh, in that sense of a divided government, Diane. So, uh, Elizabeth, what are the two parties' plans to deal with inflation, given that is the number one issue for voters? Right. Voters have been telling it to us all throughout these campaigns. It showed up in the exit polling. Inflation is still number one. So the White House Democrats have been saying that they've already passed legislation that's going to help with inflation. They point to the Inflation Reduction Act that lowers costs for certain things like insulin. They say they say that this is already in the works, so it might take a little bit of time for that to show up. They also talk about lower gas prices from the releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. On the other hand, Republicans are saying that it's been the reckless spending from Democrats that has led and to this inflation that has fueled some of these higher prices. They're vowing to cut back on spending in order to try to tame some of the inflation that we're seeing. You know, I think the really important thing to remember here, Diane, is that when it comes to inflation, this really, really important issue for every American, it's not so much down to Congress or the White House as much right now as it is to the Federal Reserve, which is tasked with trying to tame inflation. They are aggressively raising interest rates. We're seeing them say they might even risk a recession to try to bring down some of those prices that Americans are seeing every day. And that's where we're really going to feeling, be feeling it. We do get a new inflation number tomorrow. That's where the Federal Reserve is going to be looking to to see if there are more rate hikes ahead. Stock market's going to be looking at that closely, too. The White House, that, that's going to be a critical number to see what is the trajectory for this going forward and how's that going to impact borrowing costs and costs for Americans every day, Diane. Yep. A lot of people will be watching that report very closely. Elizabeth, thank you. Thanks. And as election results pour in, we're seeing candidates from both parties breaking barriers and shattering glass ceilings. ABC News projects that constituents in several states will elect their first female, black, LGBTQ and Gen Z candidates to state and federal offices. ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse joins me now to talk more about that, these historic firsts and the impact here. Mike, let's start with Gen Z. 25-year-old Maxwell Frost is in Florida becoming the first Gen Zer to win a House seat. What does it mean to have someone that young and representation from someone that young in Congress? I think it's exciting that he is in Congress. I think you're going to see new policies that are going to be presented, and I think he's going to force uh, the policies to become a priority. I definitely see him looking at climate change. Uh, I'm really curious to see, will he bring environmental justice into that space and what will be the priority of it? Really encouraging the younger vote, looking at 2024, looking ahead, seeing themselves be represented in Congress, letting them know that you don't have to wait your turn. That was always his narrative and individuals wanting to run for Congress. They had to wait to their 40s or to their 50s. But no, you can do it now at the age 25 or maybe even younger. And so I think we're going to see him also to bring in a new electorate into 2024. Making some of us feel like slackers over here. Right? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I was like, what was I doing at 25? So, not yeah, that. I was um, that. So what other races <laughs> stick out to you? 
Uh, I definitely think about Wes Moore uh, becoming the first black governor of Maryland. I thought that was fantastic. I'm really looking at Arkansas with Sarah Huckabee Sanders becoming the first woman governor for the state of Arkansas. Looking at Massachusetts for Healy becoming not only the first woman and first openly lesbian governor of Massachusetts, but the first openly lesbian governor across the country. I thought that was really fascinating. Looking at Brit, a Republican, to become the first female senator of Alabama. Uh, and so we saw so many historic firsts yesterday. And Diane, for me, what that's going to symbolize is how will policy be different? You, you can't have such a wide variety of, of elected officials now and have traditional policies and or traditional approaches to policies. And so I think we're going to see much nuanced conversation when it comes to policy discussion because of this diverse cast of elected officials. Do you think this is indicative of a changing electorate? Absolutely. I think that the electorate is changing. I think also, too, because of big tech, we have so much access to information. And also, too, now we're seeing for the first time that our vote really does matter and it can influence things. You think about the way that abortion uh, was um, really codified within state constitutions yesterday. So that's a direct connectivity of like my vote can make a difference and can make a change. And so I think as a result, you're going to see uh, the electorate is just reflective of that. Do you think this could also change who comes out to vote, motivating certain groups that may have felt disenfranchised? The youth vote sticks out to me. Uh, if they see a 25-year-old in Congress, does that then motivate younger voters to say, oh, I'm going to go out and vote? Oh, my God, time? absolutely. And, and the thing about it is you really want to bring in young people early into the, the electoral process, right, to get them used to voting early on. So if you if they see themselves in Congress, if they see the wide variety, and young people now are becoming more diverse in ideologies and identities and things that they're interested in and how they participate and become more vocal of things they want to advocate for, and now they're seeing that my vote really does can make a change, you're going to see that, but also to the representation within the states. Although Chris Jones didn't win uh, his race in Arkansas, the fact that he actually went for it uh, against a ceiling of, of race and color and context in that state, I think you're going to see more people push and try and break that gray ceiling, both in identity and in race and culture. All right, Mike, it's always great to have you. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Coming up, parts of Florida are under a hurricane watch. We have the latest on the timing and the track when we come back. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Parts of Florida are preparing for a possible hurricane as Tropical Storm Nicole strengthens. The storm is expected to become a Category 1 hurricane as it approaches Florida's east coast, potentially making landfall tonight or early tomorrow. In a major blow to Vladimir Putin, Russia's defense minister has ordered its forces to abandon the key city of Kherson in southern Ukraine. Russia has justified it as necessary to save the lives of its soldiers. The retreat marks a major victory for Ukraine. Kherson is the only regional capital Russia has captured since its invasion. Brittany Griner's legal team says she's in the process of being transferred to a Moscow, from a Moscow jail to a penal colony. She's expected to face much harsher conditions there. The WNBA star's Russian attorney says they don't know her current location or final destination. And a lucky Powerball player is waking up a billionaire. The winning ticket for the $2 billion jackpot was sold at a gas station in Altadena, California. The winner hasn't come forward yet but they will be able to choose to get a lump sum payment of $997 million or take the full $2 billion over 30 years. I think they're my relative, for sure. I'll be reaching out. I'm Diane Macedo. Do stay with us as ABC News Live continues with more news, context, and analysis. Maybe an aunt or an uncle, cousin, second cousin. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.